Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 94 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. If you're listening to this podcast, you already know that there are a lot of persistent myths around the Middle Ages that really mischaracterize it as a time of intellectual stagnation or backwards thinking. That applies to all sorts of aspects of the medieval period, but I think that it's safe to say that one of the most persistent myths is that this was a time when science slept, thanks in large part to cruel suppression on the part of the medieval church. In reality, that couldn't be further from the truth. This week, I invited Dr. Seb Falk to speak with me about medieval science and technology. In addition to his many articles on medieval astronomy and his work supervising graduate students at Cambridge, Seb is the author of The Light Ages, The Surprising Story of Medieval Science, also subtitled A Medieval Journey of Discovery in the UK. Here's our conversation on some of the everyday ways medieval people were using and advancing science, what the role of the church actually was in scientific discovery, and why astronomy reigned supreme in the Middle Ages. Well, thank you, Seb, for stopping by the podcast to talk to us about the late ages. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me on. I really enjoyed this book, and I think it's because of the enthusiasm in it. It seems like the type of book that would be written if you had a captive audience and you just got to geek out about the Middle Ages as much as possible. So I really enjoyed it for that reason. Is that kind of how it came out? Just like you just needed to express your feelings about medieval science? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of that. I think it, it was definitely a book I felt I needed to write. And it was a book I felt kind of people needed to hear as well. And there's an element of kind of my frustration at people constantly saying stuff like, oh, people in the Middle Ages thought the world was flat when they didn't. And also just, yeah, my enthusiasm, just the, the love that I have for all the the opportunities that I've had to get to handle medieval manuscripts, to get to play with instruments like astrolabes. And I just kind of wanted to share that enthusiasm with as many people as possible uh, and, and hope that I could maybe get other people enthusiastic too, enthusiastic to study the period or enthusiastic to read more about it or enthusiastic to go and visit museums and that kind of thing. I think that that definitely will happen because of this book. And I I realized that as somebody who studies medieval science, you must have been frustrated by the constant denigrating of the Middle Ages, especially in terms of science. But you come across very gently in correcting people in the introduction about it. So good for you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't like arguments. And I know that misunderstandings happen really easily. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't like to attack people. I don't like to be aggressive. I didn't want it to be a book about correcting people. I think that would have been a really horrible, boring book to read if it was just, you're wrong about this, you're wrong about that. If you believe this, you're an idiot. Um, because <laughs> nobody wants to be told they're an idiot when they're reading a book. So I kind of wanted to make it positive, make it about things that maybe people didn't consider or hadn't really thought about. If you're interested in the Middle Ages and you spend your time reading about battles and kings, have you thought about the fact that people in the Middle Ages were also looking up at the sky, trying to map the positions of the planets, trying to explain why things were the way they were, and try to put their knowledge into practice, make it a practical value for themselves. Uh, and to put it in kind of positive terms, uh, rather than saying to readers, oh, you're wrong about this, you're wrong about that, because nobody likes to be told that. That's true. And that's not, that's not how the book comes across. So you've, <laughs> you've accomplished Good. that aim. So let's get into the book and why you chose to write it the way you wrote it. And I think part of this is coming at the frustrations that you've had that medievalists have about the church and science. So the person that you have kind of leading us through the book is a monk. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose a monk as the central figure of the book? Right. Yeah. So so the central character is, is called John Westwick. He's a real person. I haven't invented him. And he was a monk of the wealthiest abbey in St. Albans. Uh, and in many ways, he's kind of an ordinary monk. And I wanted an ordinary monk because so many histories of science are told as these parades of great men. And, and it is always men in these histories who were seen as ahead of their time, who had these genius ideas popped up for a bit and then uh, history of science goes on to the next genius. And you get this kind of join the dots of geniuses. And science has never worked like that. It doesn't work like that today. And it never has in the past, because science has progressed insofar as it progresses through the achievements and the work of a huge number of people, often people whose names we don't know. So I wanted someone who was relatively ordinary, 
And as you say, I wanted a monk. Well, I mean, it, it just so happened that it was a monk because the manuscript that I was studying when I did my PhD turned out to have been written by a monk. It was thought for a long time that this manuscript, this explanation for how to make planetary computer to find the positions of the planets had been written by Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer, the poet. Uh, and that's not such a crazy idea as it sounds, because Chaucer did know a lot about astronomy and was really interested in it. Uh, but it turned out that this manuscript had been written by a monk. And that suited me really well, because as you hinted, there's this idea that the church was opposed to science. And really, that's the opposite of the truth, because the church sponsored science, the church supported science, the church wanted to find out about the universe, because they wanted to find out about God. So it made a lot of sense for it to be a monk. And this guy was in many ways an ordinary monk, but he had this incredible adventurous life. And so he didn't just stick around in one monastery. He went, uh, he was probably exiled to Tynemouth on the north coast uh, of England, where the monks were constantly complaining about the weather and the terrible food and how far it is away from everywhere and how cold it is and all the shipwrecks. I mean, their letters are brilliant. They're just full of whining and, and complaining. And then he obviously hated it so much that he was willing to sign up for a crusade. And he went off on the so-called Bishop's Crusade to Flanders, which was a total failure and disaster. Writing about that gave me an opportunity to talk about medieval navigation and mapping and so on, and medicine as well, because the whole army got dysentery. And then he crops up in London. So he's got this kind of really interesting life. I mean, I'm not going to summarize the whole book for you now. But um, but the kind of the point was, I suppose, that I wanted to give people a really hands-on look at medieval science. I wanted people to kind of learn for themselves, to figure it out for themselves. I didn't want people to have to take my word for it about how advanced medieval science was. I wanted people to kind of pick up some of the techniques for themselves. But at the same time, I wanted to uh, make it accessible to your average reader in their armchair on a Friday evening who just wants a nice relaxing read and doesn't want to have to feel like they're reading a science textbook. So I use this story as a kind of hook to make it into a more accessible, more interesting read. So every time uh, you might think you're getting a bit bogged down in spherical trigonometry, which is important for me to tell you about so that you understand how advanced medieval astronomy and mathematics were, just when you're getting a bit bogged down in all that, you get back to some story of a monk dying on the toilet or another, you know, another monk putting wings on and trying to fly from his church tower. So you get the mix of the of the hard science and the soft stories as well. Which makes a lot of sense because that's life for you right there. <laughs> that's the life of a scientist, which is like full of absurd stories and mundane details and brilliant science at the same time. Exactly right. <laughs> So you're talking about astronomy, and that's the way that you found John Westwick in the first place. Why was astronomy so important to the church? Like, we know that science was important to the church, but why astronomy specifically? Why was that so important? Yeah, astronomy is kind of at the heart of medieval science in lots of ways. First of all, it's crucial for the church because of the calendar. The church calendar, the Christian calendar, is a whole weird mix of things for really complicated historical reasons. But essentially, the, the calendar that we use today, you know, January, February, March, we inherited from the Romans, and that is a solar calendar. It approximates the passage of the sun through the stars, as, as they thought of it then, or as we think of it now, the orbit of the earth around the sun. That's a solar calendar. But other cultures had lunar calendars, uh, and that included the Jews. and the date of Easter, the most important festival in the Christian calendar, comes from the Jewish calendar, because in the Bible, um, if you read your Bible, you know that the Last Supper was a Passover feast. And so in order to kind of situate Easter in time, in order to commemorate the events of Jesus's death and, and resurrection, as Christians believed, they had to try and approximate this in this lunar calendar, as well uh, as fitting it into their normal solar calendar. And that means understanding these very complex cycles of the sun and moon, which don't map precisely onto one another. So an understanding of astronomy is essential to carrying out your Christian festivals at the correct times. And there's huge debates, particularly in the early Middle Ages, about the correct times to have these festivals and trying to map the astronomical observations that they'd made onto historical records of when things had been observed and, uh, and, and observations of new moons and full moons. 
So, uh, you know, that was at the heart of what the church was trying to achieve. But also astronomy is kind of important for us as historians to think about it when we're thinking about the development of science through the thousand year period of the Middle Ages, because astronomy was so susceptible to precise measurement, unlike other sciences, unlike, say, botany or zoology, which, you know, of course, today can be um, susceptible to measurement in their day were not so much. But astronomy was really all about measurement, was all about mathematics, was all about geometry and arithmetic and careful calculation and precise observation. And they devised really impressive instruments to make new observations, but also to demonstrate and teach other people what they had observed, what they would discovered. So astronomy is where a lot of the best science was happening because of the nature of the subject. And it's one of the key subjects in the universities, which were founded in the Middle Ages. The universities, one of the great contributions of the Middle Ages to Western culture, at least. Uh, and those instruments went towards developing a really advanced understanding, but also had really complex philosophical influences in terms of the way that people thought about the world the way that people thought about the universe as being understandable, like clockwork, wouldn't have worked if you hadn't invented a clock. So, you know, for me, it was very important in lots of ways. And that's before we even start to talk about astrology. So, uh, yeah, astronomy is is at the heart of, of my book, although it's not the only uh, science that I talk about. Right. And one of the things that is at the heart of your book is that astrolabe. You're not going to be able to teach us how to use it right now over a podcast, but can you tell us what it was for? So like the astrolabe is one of the most important instruments of the Middle Ages. What was it used for? Yeah, uh, I've got an astrolabe here now. I'm waving it at my microphone in the hope that listeners might be able to hear it, even if they can't see it. And what I've got is a brass disc. This one fits into the palm of my hand, but it could be, you know, as big as like an open hardback book. You know, they can be kind of 12 inches in diameter. And it's a brass disc and it's a kind of flat model of the heavens. So it is to a globe of the heavens as a map of the earth is to a globe of the earth. So it's a kind of flattened map of the heavens. And on this map of the heavens is engraved lines showing you kind of coordinates of the heavens, like lines of latitude and longitude on a map. And then moving over those lines, you've got a kind of grid of stars. And those stars are called fixed stars because they always keep their positions relative to one another. By knowing when the stars are rotating and where they're rotating, where they're rising above the horizon and how high they get in the sky, you can do all kinds of really interesting things. And by knowing where the sun is among the stars, as the sun moves through the stars from day to day around the year, you can tell the time, you can work out how long the day is going to be, you can work out what time the sun is going to rise and how long it's going to be light for, you can identify a star, you can find out which way is north, you can also do lots of kind of interesting surveying techniques like finding the height of a building, you could also know if you're Muslim which way to pray, to pray facing Mecca on certain astrolabes uh, and certainly what time to pray. So lots and lots of interesting kind of functions. And in that way, it's often likened, at least by me, to a smartphone, the medieval version of the smartphone. Because just as a smartphone combines the functions of a lot of other devices, like a camera and a telephone and a computer, so your astrolabe combines the functions of a clock and an inclinometer to measure height above the horizon and other devices as well, kind of uh, trigonometrical calculators too. So it's all of these functions in a neat little package. And just like a smartphone is also kind of a status symbol. It's a desirable object. People want the latest thing to show off to their friends. So were astrolabes. People bought them not necessarily because they understood all the functions, but because they were cool, because they looked good. And astrolabes often were developed and refined with really beautiful, intricate designs, which had nothing to do with their function but just made them look really awesome. <laughs> I think that is so true and such a common thing in humanity, right? Yeah. You don't necessarily know how to use all the functions on your smartphone, but you know that it looks cool. <laughs> yeah. And people people think that like our love of gadgets is a modern thing and it's really not. People in the Middle Ages loved their gadgets. I've got another one here uh, called a navicular, which is a late medieval device. And it's made in the shape of a sailing ship. 
and it's a sundial. It's just a sundial, but it's really cleverly done so that it uses what appears to be the mast of the ship to work at different times of year. And then it uses a sort of crow's nest that slides up and down the mast of the ship so that it can be used at any latitude. So they've worked all of this kind of intricate science of a universal sundial into this beautiful shape of a ship. Uh, and this kind of became popular, particularly in the early 15th century. Uh, it's sometimes known as the little ship of Venice, the Navicula de Venetis, just to look cool. You know, it doesn't add anything to the functions, but it also is kind of symbolic of navigation. And of course, navigation and timekeeping went hand in hand in the Middle Ages. So there's a whole range of symbolism that's involved in these things. And people you know, were, were very alive to the symbolism and iconography of art and craft. Yeah, well, I definitely want to come back to timekeeping, but I did want to ask how popular was the astrolabe as in how many people would have it? Would your average person have an astrolabe? Like, probably not a peasant, but would your average tradesperson have one just to have it on the shelf? Who would have them? There are, I mean, there are hundreds survived. So they were clearly a reasonably popular device. But they would have been, you know, certainly the examples that I've been talking about, these brass instruments would have been limited to people who could afford that, scholars or wealthy lay people who were interested in, in learning, and of course, wealthy religious people. But astrolabes could come in simpler versions as well. They didn't all have to be intricate brass objects. You could make them out of wood. You could even make them out of parchment, although obviously they wouldn't be so good for observation, but you could still use many of their calculating functions. And some of those do also survive inside books. So you would have to, I suppose, have achieved at least a reasonable level of understanding to get something out of it. And you would also have to be reasonably wealthy, both to afford an astrolabe and probably to access the kind of education that you would need to derive some benefit from it. But they were they were reasonably widespread. And I think literacy also was not as rare a thing as it's often cracked up to be. You know, people assume that almost nobody could read, but actually a goodly number of people had some level of education, albeit, you know, only to, to what they needed to get by day to day. But it, it was, you know, still a reasonable number of people for sure. Yeah, that's really important. I don't think we have time to get into all of literacy, but speaking of time, <laughs> <laughs> one of the questions I get asked really often is how did people tell time in the Middle Ages? So what were some of the ways that in which people told time in the Middle Ages? That's a really interesting question. And it's kind of a complicated answer. And there's kind of two parts to that answer. First of all is one is how they thought about time. And the second is practically how they found out what time it was. And the first question of those, which people don't often think to ask is actually really important because the later Middle Ages in particular is when the current system of time that we use today of equal hours, in other words, every hour is the same length, was cemented and came into common use, largely through the introduction of the mechanical clock, a clock that beats out exact amounts of, of time. Before that, medieval people were more likely to use something that we now today call unequal hours or seasonal hours. And in that system, there was always 12 hours from sunrise to sunset and always 12 hours from sunset to sunrise. So here I am now in the northern hemisphere in winter. The amount of time from sunrise to sunset is not very long. You don't get a huge amount of daylight at this time of year in England, but there's still 12 hours and there's still 12 hours from sunset to the following sunrise. Now, that might seem unnecessarily complicated, but it makes a lot of sense in a world where you do most of what you have to do during daylight, certainly in the fields, in agriculture, but equally in the church. There was more demand for scholarship, more demand for learning. Of course, if you're copying manuscripts, candlelight, it doesn't produce as much light as you might like it to. Uh, you can do a huge amount more in daylight than you can do in uh, in darkness and monks adapted their schedules adapted their offices their religious commitments to the seasons and so it made a lot of sense to have this system in which there were always 12 hours from sunrise to sunset no matter how much daylight there was so that's the the unequal hours and there's a shift from the unequal hours to the equal hours precisely around the time that mechanical clocks come in because sundials could 
show you unequal hours or equal hours, just depending on how you engrave them. And sundials go back to you know ancient times and were a very common way to tell the time and were a very popular way and came in all kinds of interesting and different designs, some of them localized to a particular place, some of them universal so they could be carried around. And then when the mechanical clock comes in at the end of the 13th century and people work out, essentially solve the problem they had been trying to solve for, for at least a century of how to make a falling weight give out an equal amount of power as it falls rather than speeding up as it kind of accelerates. It's an issue of acceleration and how to control that using what uh, horologists call an escapement mechanism. As they start to figure that out, they start to make it work. Those clocks, apart from the fact that the metal might contract a little bit when it's cold, they're not going to change the amount of time that they tell at different times a year. And that's when the equal hours come in. So there are many, many ways of telling the time. Uh, you've got the sundials. And then by the end of the Middle Ages, you have the clocks. In between, you have water clocks, clepsydra, as they're sometimes known, which work in all kinds of different ways. The first clocks didn't have faces, actually. The first clocks were just alarms. And the word clock, if you know your French, cloche or German glocke, like a glockenspiel, is the sound of the bells. That's the word for bell. And so the first clocks didn't have faces. They just had bells. They were alarm clocks, essentially. Trouble is, very very few of those survive. So medieval people were great at recycling. So if they could reuse materials, they did. And if they couldn't reuse materials, they burned them or they threw them away. So nothing was kind of left perfectly in place for us to discover and understand later, or very few things were. And so very few of these very early clocks survive, but we have written references to them. For example, in 1198, there was a fire at the Abbey of Bury St. Edmunds, and the monks desperate to put out the fire they go and they look for whatever water they can and the first thing they come across is their water clock so they grab the water clock and they throw the water from the water clock on the fire and they put out the fire so that's how we know there was a water clock at Barry St Edmunds in 1198 because there was a fire if there hadn't been a fire we wouldn't know about the water clock so time is important of course there are lots of ways of telling the time one thing I haven't even mentioned is just looking at the stars, which monks do, and, and measuring the kind of risings of the stars against their buildings. And so just time, of course, is a measure of the motion of the heavens. So if you can see the heavens, you can tell the time. <laughs> yeah, there are so many ways to Sorry, do it. Sorry, that but... was an extremely long answer, but there's so much that could be said about that. No, no, that's good, because I, I think that, well, many of the people that I speak to are creating fiction, for example, and uh, they want to know how their people in the story can tell the time. And so it's important to know different ways to do that. If it's cloudy, you can't see the sun. Right. How, how are you doing that? So yeah, yeah. Well, water clocks, water clocks do work, but you have to set your water clock, right? You have to know how much water to put in your water clock. So by itself, it might not work very well, but it when it is working, unless it freezes, it works very reliably. An astrolabe, of course, could be used to tell the time, but it's a bit overkill in some ways because it does so much more than that. <laughs> but that's okay. It's like people pulling out the latest smartphone to check the time, exactly. right? Just so yeah, yeah. everyone can see. <laughs> I'm a real rarity. I still wear a wristwatch, but uh, not very many people do anymore, I think. I think that's true. People are going to look back and say, how did they tell the time <laughs> in 2021? <laughs> Um, one of the things that I found interesting about this book is you explain finger counting. And that's another thing that is very like on the ground, useful thing that, that people needed to know. And when I think about this, you're talking about different ways to hold the finger to represent different numbers and how if you had a time machine and you held up your fingers in a certain way, it would confuse everybody. So how did people count on their fingers in ways that allowed them to do these complex calculations because they were able to do that just using their fingers. So you think that you could describe that for us over yeah, audio? <laughs> sure, absolutely. And I think the important thing to think about this is that people in science and in technology always develop the technologies that they need to carry out the functions in their day-to-day -day life that they have to do. Essentially, if it's not broken, you don't fix it. So the use of finger counting goes hand in hand with the use of Roman numerals. And it's often said that Roman numerals were really impossible to work with. And essentially, science couldn't proceed until the Hindu Arabic numerals came into Europe from the Islamic world, well, really from India via the Islamic world. And, you know, in some ways, there's a grain of truth in that. But in another way, actually, even when the Hindu Arabic numerals did come in, they weren't picked up straight away, because there wasn't really a need for them. So, you know, you asked me about finger counting, 
the way that finger counting works is it, it, it kind of fulfills the needs that people have at the time. And that is essentially to remember the numbers that they're calculating in their heads and also to communicate. Uh, and this is why it's so popular in the monastery, because there were a lot of times in the monastery when you weren't allowed to talk because silence was really valued for contemplation and for peace and quiet. We could do with a bit more silence these days, I think. And so these things are not just about calculating, they're also about showing numbers. So if I put it really simply, if you hold up your hands in front of you with your backs of your hands towards you, your thumbs together, your palms facing away from you, the three fingers of your left hand, the little finger, the ring finger and the middle finger, you use for the digits. And the word digit comes from fingers, comes from the Latin for fingers. And that's why we call them digits. And then the next two, the, the index finger and the thumb of your left hand are your tens. And then the next two, the thumb and index finger of your right hand are your hundreds. And then the last three, the middle finger, the ring finger and the pinky of your right hand are your thousands. So already this looks kind of backwards, right? We're used to seeing thousands on the left and units on the right. But as I'm looking at my own hands, I'm seeing units on the left and thousands on the right. But that is a very kind of cooperative thing, because it means that somebody facing me can see them the correct way. So if you're looking at me on the camera, I don't know, unless my camera's flipped it, as these things sometimes do, you'll be seeing the thousands on, on your left, but my right, and the units on your right, but my left. The other reason, incidentally, to do the units and tens on your left hand is so that if you're taking notes with your right hand, which most people are right-handed, you can still do the small numbers while taking notes. And so by dedicating a column of units, tens, hundreds and thousands to a group of two or three fingers and making the digits one to nine with those kind of shapes of those fingers and you know the way you fold those fingers over one another or put one up and one down and so on, you can count to 9,999 on your hands. And of course, additions can be done quite simply. It's mostly a sort of calculation in your head. But in a way, even the most complex calculations that you do on paper, you are still doing the individual calculations in your head. You know, when if I want to multiply 742 by 53 on paper, I'm doing each individual part of that in my head and then noting down the results on paper so I don't forget where I am and then doing the extra bits in my head. And that's kind of what people are doing, except rather than noting it down on parchment, which of course was often quite precious and scarce, they could do it on their hands and thereby use their hands to remember where they were in the sum until they got to the final answer. That was really well explained. Nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure how that was going to work over audio, but that worked really well. I hope so. I think that I need to ask for all the people who are curious, what is the connection? So you start with John Westwick and his connection to Chaucer and then come back to it near the end and mention what is the connection that he had to Chaucer? Right. So when the manuscript was first discovered in the 1950s in Cambridge by a historian called Derek de Sola Price, Price took one look at this manuscript, saw that it was a instruction manual for an astronomical instrument. It was written in Middle English, the fashionable or increasingly fashionable Middle English, and it was dated in the early 1390s. And Price knew that Geoffrey Chaucer had written in Middle English, had written about astronomical instruments, and had worked in the 1390s. And the manuscript mentioned Chaucer's name. It just had Chaucer's name as a kind of citation, really, in the manuscript. So Price said, oh, this must be by Chaucer, and spent a lot of time and a lot of energy trying to prove that it was by Chaucer. Some people believed him, some people didn't believe him. The arguments went back and forth for decades. That was the 1950s. When I came to it in the early 2000s, it still hadn't been resolved until a Norwegian scholar named Karianna Rand found the same handwriting in another manuscript and was able to connect it to this guy, John of Westwick. And then the question is, well, if it is by John of Westwick and it is his handwriting in the manuscript and it fits with him in so many ways, I mean, you know, it, it is concluded beyond all reasonable doubt that John Westwick wrote this manuscript and it's connected with the abbeys that he was part of and the other kind of work that he did. Why does he cite Chaucer? Well, actually, that was already a problem when it was thought that Chaucer had written it, because why would anybody cite themselves? And what 
does he have to do with Chaucer? And the answer is, well, we know from the details and the data in the manuscript that he was working in London. He talks about the fact that he's in London. He gives the latitude of London correctly and the altitudes of certain stars which he'd observed at London. So he was clearly working in London. And Chaucer was kind of part of a community of learned people. London was a small place, of course, in the later Middle Ages, particularly after the Black Death wiped out a large chunk of its population. London was a small place. Monks frequently went to London because it was a centre of commerce and also a centre of government. The abbot of St Albans maintained a kind of house or a sort of office, a base in the city of London. And it was very likely that John Westwick was there. And he would have had an opportunity to meet Chaucer in this kind of network of learning, this network of scholarship, which is where Chaucer's astrolabe treatise, Chaucer's instruction manual, his kind of astrolabes for dummies or bread and milk for children, as he called it. (laughs) Chaucer wrote this instruction manual uh, and it was very widely distributed very quickly after it was written. So it was clearly widely read. And John Westwick had clearly read this because he cites it directly. He says in the treatise of the astrolabe, this is a a technical term that's used, and I'm going to use the same technical term. And so he's clearly read the treatise on the astrolabe. And so he's cited Chaucer, whether he's met Chaucer or not, I don't know. It's it's possible that they'd had, you know, certainly they would have had an opportunity to meet. And certainly he's used Chaucer's work. And this is something that people love to do in the Middle Ages was cite influential scholars. And they're not just citing other Christians either. You know, uh, John Westwick is citing Muslim scholars as well. And of course, um, they, they're they all going back to ancient Greek learning too. So the whole kind of sense of international communication in these manuscripts. And I'm glad that you brought that up because, again, when you think of a monk writing stuff or a monk working through science, perhaps you imagine that they are not connected with other religions. And in this case, when it comes to science, it's definitely not the case for Christians who are borrowing ideas from all over the place, right? That's right. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the pace of communication was a lot slower than it is today. But it's really important to emphasize that Christians had no objection to taking ideas from other religions, from other cultures. And we see that throughout medieval scholarship. There's a a really interesting comment on the top of an instruction manual or a kind of treatise, a, a textbook for using the new Hindu Arabic numerals, the new numbers we use today, written by a monk in Bury St. Edmunds explaining how Al Khwarizmi, a Central Asian scholar who worked in Baghdad, had got these ideas from India. So it's Indian ideas used by a Central Asian scholar whose name Al Khwarizmi gives us the modern word algorithm in the Middle East, picked up by Christians, transmitted to like the far corner of the world, because of course, England was the end of the world in the (laughs) Middle Ages, uh, and studied by a monk, a Christian, who understood precisely, well, not precisely, but understood in general terms, where these ideas had come from, and was totally okay with that. There was no prejudice against these ideas, purely because they came from other religions. In fact, theologians, you know, theologians as as, uh, influential as St. Augustine, said, you've got to get the best answers from where they come from. And it's better for a Christian to pick up ideas from pagans, if they are accurate, than to be kind of ignorantly wedded to what he might read in the Bible. And they 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 go on about this at great length. It's, you know, it's important to study nature because you want to understand the mind of God. You want to understand how God works in creation. And you have to take the sources that you can to enhance your knowledge. Absolutely. And as you're saying, the the goal is more important than how you got there. And I think that we might imagine there's more of a separation between cultures than there actually is. When you are sharing ideas, you know, you want to share them with people, no matter what their background is. And that's something that obviously you've done in the book, sharing your ideas (laughs) and your knowledge with people. I do want to ask before I let you go, this is kind of greatest hits of all your favorite things for the Middle Ages. But obviously, you had to do some research on it as well. So in doing the research for this book, was there anything that was really surprising to you where people had actually gone further than you had expected, for example? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, Some of the explanations or attempts to explain the really unusual phenomena like comets And even rainbows, of course, rainbows aren't unusual, but they're difficult to explain. The intensity of of questioning, particularly around comets and things where you can you can see a comet and medieval people started from the position that 
the heavens were unchanging and that everything in the heavens kind of moved in these very long, slow cycles. And they could observe that comets were above the clouds and, you know, were outside appeared to be even beyond the moon. You know, the moon might pass in front of a, of a slow moving comet. And yet it didn't quite seem to compute like how this might be and how they might come about. And these kind of attempts to understand these non-conforming phenomena is just incredibly incredibly rich because you can see these minds at work they're trying to make trying to figure it out they don't have all the instruments and equipment that we have today but they're using their phenomenal intelligence and they're talking to each other about it to try to theorize and to try to hypothesize and come up with plausible explanations and you know sometimes they come up with excellent explanations i mean the rainbow is more or less solved in the middle ages as being a, a combination of a refraction and reflection within a water droplet which is actually a you know pretty impressive piece of science when you think about it. And that's done through constant questioning, asking, reading, writing, thinking. Actually, now that you mention it, the rainbow was probably the thing that stuck out to me as well, because that is something I would not be able to figure out on my own. I mean, most of the things, most of the things in this, I would not be able to figure out on my own. Math is not my strong suit, but that is so sophisticated to figure out that not only is it from water droplets, but a combination of water droplets that together make the same picture. Like that's super impressive. It really is. I mean, everything that I read about these medieval scholars, I'm just wowed. I'm impressed because, you know, they had maybe a little bit more time on their hands than we have, but they certainly didn't have the sources of information that we have. And they just had to kind of look up at the skies and figure things out for themselves. And they did a great job. Absolutely. They did a great job. And I really appreciate that you've consolidated this as kind of a, a beginning a beginning place for people to learn about medieval science in a broad range of topics, because I think there is a lot, there's a lot of places to go after reading this book to learn more about medieval science, but it, it's a great place to start for people who are new to it, or even for people who, who are like me and, and have been reading this stuff, but not reading about the science. So mm. I really appreciated the book. I'm glad you wrote it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge amount that, of course, I had to leave out of the book. And of course, it is focused because it's focused on the life of this one monk. It's focused on the kind of things that he would have known in 14th century England. So, you know, there are bits of earlier, earlier medieval Europe and, of course, the world outside Europe, although Europe was heavily influenced by the Middle East and, and distantly by India. You know, huge things that I that I had to had to leave out, sadly. But I hope at least it's given people a kind of sense that people in the Middle Ages were not as severely held back as you might expect by the fact that they didn't have all of the complex instruments that we have today. And so it's given people, hopefully it will give readers an appreciation of what medieval people could figure out just by looking at the world around them and a kind of respect for the Middle Ages, which is so often slandered and belittled by people who are, are ignorant of, of everything that was achieved in that period. Yes, which is ironic, but we don't need to get into that. <laughs> well, if you if you've left things out, that means that you get to write a sequel, right? Or left <laughs> left uh, work for other people to do, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast to talk to us about medieval science and the light ages. Really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. To find out more about Seb's work, you can visit his page at sebfalk.com. You can also follow him on Twitter, where he shares fascinating stuff like demonstrating how to use an astrolabe at Seb underscore Falk. His readable and seriously information-packed book is called The Light Ages, The Surprising Story of Medieval Science. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's new, Peter? Hey, hey, so there's actually going to be a medieval TV starting this March. It's going to be a French video demand on-demand service. They're calling it the Netflix for medieval culture, and it's going to be a subscription service people can sign up to. You'll be able to see like music, history, cooking shows. We're just getting all those details now, and we'll have that on Medievalist.net for you. Plus, we have news about a new digital exhibition at the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. They're kind of celebrating the 700th anniversary of Dante Alighieri's passing, and they're doing it by uh, showing off these beautiful 16th century illustrations from a copy of Divine Comedy. So you can all well, check that those kind of beautiful things out. So we have that on this site. Plus, we have Michael Fulton talking about the two towers of Acre, the infamous Tower of the Flies and the Accursed Tower, and their interesting histories. So all that on Medievalist.net this week. 
That sounds great, Peter. Thanks. Thanks. As always, it's time to express some love and gratitude to our patrons on patreon.com for all your awesomeness. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to help put to bed some of the stickiest myths of the Middle Ages. So thank you to each and every one of you. Patrons of the Medieval Podcast get access to fun stuff like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare Magazine and the Medieval Magazine, membership in our book club, and our exclusive maps by Tina Ross. And they get the satisfaction of helping to redeem the reputation of our favorite time period. To find out more about how to become a patron, visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from science to sagas, follow medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at medievalists. You can follow me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, at your favorite online bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an awesome day. <laughs> <laughs>